Let's head on into the big room where they're talking about regional transit. Of the highest numbers of low-income persons in the city of Cleveland. So how do we make sure that the jobs were accessible to those individuals? And so economic inclusion was a big thing for us. We also had a number of incubators because of all of the health institutions and the uh, university. And so we said, how do we keep those companies there? They were moving out. So we had this idea that we needed post-incubator space, that next step. You come out of the incubator, don't move to the suburbs, stay in Cleveland. What were we missing? How can we put that here? And we knew that these were both powerhouses of jobs. So how did we attract additional businesses to an area that was largely vacant? This map shows you on the left there is the health tech, is downtown, and on the right is University Circle. We branded the middle area the Health Tech Corridor. It has its own website. We even have a director of the Health Tech Corridor now, these many years later. And we need that as we're bringing in a lot of companies. It wasn't like that at the beginning. It took us eight developers. We talked to eight. Um, they all said no. And then one of them came back and said, you know, if I'm not part of the solution, I may be part of the problem. So what do you have? Let's take a look. Uh, when we did this project, as I said, it opened in 2008. So you're trying to attract developers in what is the height of the recession. So try going to the bank and saying, hey, we need money for a spec building. It would be great, really. So um, we couldn't get any funding. And this is one of the reasons why, besides the fact it was a recession, no one believed in this area as being an area that could actually be developed. So we really said, listen, we think this is a fantastic area. This transit's great. It's going right through the middle. How can we make it work? But this is what we were dealing with. Brownfields, buildings that had been stripped and scrapped. They were vacant. Um, a lot of used car lots, a lot of junkyards. Um, and just buildings that might have been beautiful one day, but in most cases, many of them could not be saved, although we did save several of them and redevelop them. Zoning issues, we looked at the zoning in the area and we did a complete zoning overlay. So we really looked at how could we really support transit with the type of zoning that we would pick. So we reduced the number of parking spaces that were required. We required buildings to be built right up to the street. So again, this area had a lot of missing buildings, like missing teeth. And um, when we did bring this developer in, he was a suburban developer, because I was desperate for anybody, said, please come. And uh, he showed me the picture of the first building. It was set back. There was a bunch of parking in front, a bunch of grass. I said, oh, I, thinking to myself, I thought developers looked at zoning. They don't. So um, he complained about how much it would cost. And I asked him how much. I gave him a grant and said, OK, now let's do it right. So we, we, we got it done. So um, one of the things when you start developing your transit that I'll tell you is people have different agendas. So at, at the beginning, people, you know, they, they may start off seeming like everyone's on the same page, but down the road you will hit some bumps. We had um, some nonprofits wanted to get City Land Bank land to put in permanent supportive housing and a low-income senior housing project. To me, they were great ideas. They wanted to be close to those anchor institutions, the hospitals, et cetera. But the developers, the Community Development Corporation, and the businesses in the area said, oh, forget it. You can't put that here. That's going to be awful. You're going to ruin everything. Um, so I went in to talk to Mayor Jackson. And I said, Mayor, here's the problem. They're complaining about this. And the mayor said, here's what you tell them. Give them a call. Let them know. We won't spend any more money over there if they're going to have this attitude. So they called back. And they said, oh, we're not going to support it, but we won't oppose it. That was fine. Now, three years after they've been open and operating, everyone says it was a great thing because it was actual new construction, which showed people this is a great place to invest. This is the first project. In the middle there, it was a new construction building. That was the one. It was totally spec. And um, you can see that we actually funded it. We got under construction in November 2010. And it was completed in June 2011. You can see how many square feet. The de same developer then bought building two and building three. He's now on his sixth building in the corridor. And in this building alone, 467 jobs between the three. And if you notice, 25% minorities. And we'll talk a little bit about economic inclusion. And that was something that was very important to the mayor and to a lot of our partners and what we really did to encourage that. This is the actual senior housing project, which you can see it's a very nice building. And once it came up, everyone agreed, yeah, this is a good thing. We were kind of silly, but 
people get that way. They get really entrenched that this is my vision and it has to be this way and only this way. So you have to really help them understand it's going to be okay. Um, we have a little bit of a market surge. Now remember, it opened in 2008. We started construction of the first building in 2010, finished in 11. Now here it is, 2015, at the end of 15, finally we've got people really coming to the area wanting to invest. Um, it was a great thing about three years ago, the local brokerage houses all started reporting on Midtown as an area for real estate. So that was like a huge moment for me. I was running around City Hall. Everyone thought I was crazy. I didn't know what I was talking about. But for me, that was great news. Um, we have here University Hospitals in red there is building a women's and children's clinic. On the right hand side, all the buildings in blue, the first building on the bottom, the same developer in that Midtown Tech Park has put the financing together for that building. And also, I don't have it outlined, but just above there you see a, a rectangle. That's an old warehouse that he's also bought. He's doing that simultaneously. He's got the funding put together for that. These will be tech spec space. And uh, we have a lot of need for technology uh, companies there. They really want to move to the corridor. And the last bullet is we have 140,000 square foot space that we've been working with the developer on. And we've attracted dealer tire. They were actually moving out of the city. We heard about it. It was the only building in the city they really fit in. And so we really went, talked to them, showed them the building, and convinced them that they needed to make an investment in the city. So they've agreed to do that. They're putting in a parking deck, because we need that type of parking density over there. 450 jobs, plus they're adding at least 150 jobs in the next three years. And then a note about property valuations, and that is that um, they've greatly increased. So they had gone down by 58% through 2006. They've gone up 325%. And then just a little bit about economic inclusion. These are some of the efforts that we've worked on. It's got to be deliberate. You're really trying to work with people and say, hey, we need you to be able to help us to make sure that people in these neighborhoods are getting opportunities. And so we've got a variety of partners, including our anchors, the foundation, the city, the county, all coming together at least quarterly and talking about this and coming up with ideas. And these are some of the things that we're working on, from phlebotomy training and pharmacy assistant training that we have because we understand that the universities have great shortages there. It's a program that can be learned in a year. Um, to working with individual companies that say, yeah, I've got jobs, we can work with neighborhood residents. And so we've really been able to get a lot of impact just by sitting and talking with people, but it's got to be deliberate. And then that's my information. I've got a booklet at the back that shows every project. So for those of you, this project was named the, um, by ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, as the most follow-on development for a transit project in North America. So I've got every single project in this booklet, which you can pick up in the back, or if you go to rethinkcleveland.org, you'll be able to pick it up there as well as my presentation. So I'm going to bring Beth Osborne up to talk about the national perspective. And thank you very much. All right, hi everybody. I'm gonna be referring to this, I'm gonna try not to lift it up because I know I'm a shrimp and no one can see me over it, but I can't be trusted with paper. So everything has to be electronic or I won't follow it. Um, so I just wanted to give people a little bit of background real quick. Uh, Transportation for America is a part of a group called Smart Growth America. We just focus on the transportation side, but we're one big happy family. For those that have seen uh, some of the reports that Smart Growth America does, like that uh, um, talks about the danger of streets that are not designed for pedestrians and bicyclists, uh, called Dangerous by Design. So before I get started, one of the things I just want to mention is we are actually at a really unique time for transit. Um, I, I just came from Washington, D.C., which is where we're based, and we've been following what's going on on Capitol Hill. Um, the, the programs that typically fund transit are called New Starts and Small Starts. Sometimes uh, projects are funded uh, through the program Tiger that, that I funded uh, while I was there. Um, but New Starts and Small Starts are the biggest ones, and what's really interesting is traditionally, and when I say traditionally, I mean for the last 15 or 20 years, which is my, my lifespan in D.C., um, the House would propose a very small number for those programs, and the Senate would plus it up, and then they go to conference, and it comes out in the middle. 
Well, this year, the Senate's put in good numbers for these programs, and the House came and, and beat the Senate on new starts uh, by, by $200 million. And I've been asking my friends who work in the House, what the heck happened? Uh, why is the, the House putting so much money into transit? And the answer is because all their districts are building transit. We've reached that point where it's just being built everywhere, and, and it's led to a big change in attitude towards the program. Um, it's, very, it's very exciting. All right, so. Here's a list of the cities that are building rail transit. Uh, and making major investments in rail transit, you know, we're going to have to shift our opinions of what are really transit cities in the very near future. Seattle, for example, is about to go to the ballot to raise about $50 billion over the next 25 years to expand their transit system. If they do that, they will have a rail transit system bigger than Washington, D.C.'s. You know, so we think of those East Coast cities as the big uh, rail centers. They won't be for long with uh, Dallas and uh, Salt Lake City and, and uh, Seattle hot at our heels. We have a, a large number of communities that are putting money into bus rapid transit as well. Uh, now, one of the, and we'll get into this a little bit more, what is bus rapid transit is very different from community to community. Um, and it's very important when you look at what's being done across the country to dig into what they mean by bus rapid transit. Are they using dedicated lanes? Are they doing off-board fare collection? Things like that, because not all BRT is the same. And the reason these investments are being made is partially about transit and giving people access to jobs and opportunity. It is also because we have discovered that these sorts of investments bring a lot of development with them. In my hometown of New Orleans, uh, the Loyola Avenue streetcar extension brought $2 billion in development around it in an area that really had not been very interested or interesting to developers <laughs> since, since I was a kid. Um, this is why transit is successful. We actually did a study called Core Values, which you can find on our website. And it talk, we went and talked to a bunch of companies that are moving uh, from more traditional suburban office parks into uh, walkable areas. They're often still suburban areas, but they're where transit is. And that's very, very important to them. Their walk score goes up their bike score goes up, their transit score goes up by very large amounts. And it's because uh, young people today are a little picky about where they live. They tend to move where they're gonna, where they wanna live and then they look for a job. So the jobs are now chasing them. And keeping talent is a tricky thing, so they need to go to the areas that attract that talent. Now, uh, this is the sort of, there are often times where you will see um, transit, but it's surrounded by parking. That is not the sort of transit that those big businesses are looking for. They're looking for areas like this. Um, there's a story from Northern Virginia of a company that was looking to move outside of a transit corridor, and people kept asking them, well, where will we go out to eat? And they said, well, we'll build a cafeteria. And the scoffing was, was huge. No, I'm not going to a company cafeteria for food. I want that. There's a, I could go through. I could do a whole presentation on nothing but the examples of the big companies that are moving on top of transit and, and are fighting each other to be on top of transit. This is in Phoenix. Um, there's another example, I believe, also with State Farm in Atlanta to be on top of their, their system as well. Um, this is a really staggering statistic. Now, people, people think of Washington, D.C. as having a lot of development near transit, but this is actually not uh, has not typically been the case. This is a recent phenomenon, and it's an example of how quickly people adjust their attitudes towards an area and their impression. Um, for a long time, the Orange Line was seen as a failure because development took so long to come there, but by the time it did, it, it, it's gone so quickly, they now have affordability problems along that corridor. And now, our only impression of a lot of this transit system is that's where the development comes. And as you can see, uh, the Washington Post reported in 2013 that 84% of the development in the region is within a quarter mile of the rail transit. So uh, I, I can, 
I couldn't choose between, but trust me, and if you all look at the full presentation, you can go into every community and find it, Dallas. A lot of people will dismiss it when I say DC or Philly or New York, but it is true in every area. But the big question is, well, will this happen with BRT? And we helped to fund a study done by Professor Nelson um, that was, has been peer reviewed that looks at this very issue and whether or not BRT will bring the same sort of development. And what they have found is that BRT does in fact attract a good amount of development. Um, they do find, however, that just like with rail transit, you don't build the line and then wash your hands of it and hope everything works out. And there are examples of rail transit where there was not a strong economic development side of things and the development doesn't come. You need an effort like you see in Cleveland where there's gonna be serious land use changes, there's gonna be changes to parking policy and densities and height restrictions and all those sorts of things to really, really make it work. There's gonna be incentives to convince developers that are not used to being in that area and are not used to working with those uh, new standards to try it out. So here are some of the things that they've discovered. Uh, they've uh, found, this is the third bullet's what I really want to focus on for a second. The quality of the BRT really matters. And one of the great things about BRT is it is cheaper to build and it's faster to build. And it's also much more flexible than rail in terms of where you put it. Here's the problem with BRT. It's much more flexible than rail. Uh, and, and in terms of attracting development, as you look for ways to make the BRT cheaper and cheaper, you start to lose the R. It starts to become bus, and just plain old bus. And so you, you tell the community, I'm gonna build you this great, innovative bus system, like nothing you've seen, and then you need to shave a little bit of money off here and here, and next thing you know, it's in traffic with the rest, and it doesn't have anything but typical bus, uh, 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 fare collection or stations, and you have bus, but you've sold it as BRT, and then when it doesn't work, then it's because BRT doesn't work. It is really important to look at the quality of BRT and to talk with the developers about what they're looking at, because it's the permanence of the investment that gets people excited about it. That's those dedicated lanes, that's really good stations, the sort of quality that comes with light rail. And here are some of the interesting stats. Uh, office space increased by one third in the, the systems they looked at. Uh, it's a long list of systems that they looked at. They looked at uh, Cleveland, Los Angeles, Phoenix, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, the Bronx, a whole bunch of communities, uh, uh, Las Vegas, and uh, Eugene, areas big and small, and they found across them that office space increased by a third in the area, and they did the research over the time of the, the recession, and they found that areas along the BRTs that they studied did better in general than, than uh, each metropolitan area. Um, I wanted to also, I'm gonna just go through this very, very quickly. Uh, just like development doesn't happen by accident, uh, equity doesn't happen by accident either. And uh, you can't just lay back and assume that because this might be an underdeveloped area that uh, it will stay affordable, it will provide access to all kinds of people looking for all kinds of jobs. It takes real energy to make sure that happens. It takes talking to the communities affected and the folks that provide jobs to those communities that are affected and a real focus on this. Um, it also, when affordability becomes a problem, it happens very quickly. It's not a problem for a long time and then it just flips and there's really no way to stop it at that point and you're playing catch up. So it's extremely important to be thinking about it all the way through. Now we work with some great folks uh, over at Enterprise Community Partners and they have some incredible guidance in this area. They actually have a, a whole uh, uh, equitable uh, transit-oriented development 101 course that they provide. Um, one of the areas that we really like to look at is Denver, Colorado, um, which is an area that has put in a lot, of, this is rail transit too, but they also have BRT, and they have put in a lot of money uh, into their system in a very short period of time. They have seen property values go up in areas and create affordability problems downtown. 
but they also created a TOD fund that is focused on preserving affordable housing. And they also created an organization called Mile High Connects that works with communities uh, to help people find affordable housing and, uh, and jobs. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, there's just a list, there's a, a ton of tools available to folks that care about this. And that is where I'm going to end it. And I'm gonna call it Michael. Thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, having us here today. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the problem in um, Southeast Michigan. Uh, we're not a connected region. Uh, Oakland, Macomb, Wayne, Washtenaw. Um, we have four transit services that do the best they can, but we're not a connected region. If you look here in the green, which represents uh, in the middle there, uh, DDOT, and the red, SMART, uh, most of those services need to be connected uh, to get where you want to go. You need to transfer to be able to make your trip. You look over here in Washtenaw County, there's really no connection by public transportation with the exception of maybe the air ride uh, service that goes to the airport. So when we think about transportation, um, we have a region that is not connected and that's really what we're trying to do with our plan. It's a major focus of making sure that people can get from where they wanna go uh, so we have that kind of flexibility and mobility. One other thing I'd like to make Real clear, 92% of the jobs are not accessible within 60 minutes of transit, public transportation. It's 2016, and that statistic is very alarming, 92% in this region. When you look at midday service, this is kind of the best it gets, and there's only a few, a hand, a few of the routes right now that really operate throughout the day. But that's really what it looks like during the midday. And not everybody works a nine to five. So you think about all the times that people need to get to and from where they wanna go for jobs, to healthcare, to other type of appointments. That's really what the system looks like in the midday. One reason why we have this problem is we don't invest. We don't invest in public transportation. If you look at our peers here, um, we're about $67. If you look, say, at a Chicago at uh, 272 and a Seattle at 428. We have not invested in transportation for many, many years. So one of the major problems that we have is that we have the system, the systems that we have right now. So what the plan really tries to do is really connect the region. We know that we have a disconnected region. We know that we need to get people to jobs. We know we need to make sure that people have mobility options throughout. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the plan. This is a plan that really has resonated for people, but this is about a year and a half of talking to people, being out there listening to the business community, social service agents, going through clergy, hearing what people have to say, and going to meetings to make sure that we have the breadth of a plan that's going to be meaningful to our constituents throughout the four counties. Uh, starting with the bus rapid transit, I know it was mentioned a little bit about bus rapid transit. We've got from Detroit all the way up to uh, Mount Clemens uh, to M59, basically uh, rapid, reliable transportation moving forward, running about every 15 minutes, uh, getting your uh, fare card ahead of time, uh, dedicated lanes, signal prioritization is part of that. We also have no another one from Detroit all the way up to Pontiac. Uh, the same type of configuration, and also Detroit to the airport. And then if you look over uh, in Washtenaw, we have bus rapid transit from Ypsilanti to Ann Arbor. This is high quality bus rapid transit. Uh, we're not looking to do this on the cheap. It's very, very important. We know to attract riders, we've got to have services that are gonna resonate for them, have the quality, the frequency that's necessary. Uh, another component is uh, rail. Um, from Ann Arbor to Detroit. Uh, the proposal is eight trips a day, getting you where you want to go, early in the morning, in the midday, and at night, so you can have those connections you need to get where you want to go. Cross-county connections are the services are outlined in the orange, and that's really to get you where you want to go, working with our transit providers. I should emphasize that this is a 
a, a service that integrates with the existing system for, DART, for SMART, uh, DDOT, AATA, and the people mover. So integrating to make the service more effective, more efficient, getting you where you want to go, but contracting with them in this process to have more bandwidth on, say, a 15-mile or a Grand River, uh, these type of services uh, connecting people more directly, less transferring, more frequency, later night, earlier morning, more service in the midday, better weekend service are the, all the things that we've heard to move this region forward. Uh, so those are the cross-county connectors. We also want to focus on local communities where the jobs are. There's going to be either new local service or extended local service to connect people to where they want to go because there's jobs in those communities. People need to be able to get where they want to go or connect to a major mainline service there as well. Um, streetcar, uh, the Q line, obviously that's operating. That should be uh, operational, I believe, in the spring of 17, uh, known as M1 Rail, but now the Q line. Uh, and that's going to be a game changer. It really talks about what we can get done in this region. The other thing that we're focused on is getting people to jobs through express type services. So we have express services taking people uh, to jobs, probably a park and ride where they can drop off their car, get on, get where they want to go in an express type mode. So we're looking at those type of services as well. Uh, airport is another major hub we want to make sure that people can get to the airport in a reasonable manner and have the kind of services that are important to get you there. It's a gateway to when you get to uh, an airport and getting back and forth. And finally, a huge focus on paratransit and mobility. Regional mobility, folks that are senior and people with disabilities, having the flexibility, the freedom to get where they want to go, when they want to get there, be able to cross county boundaries and get where they need to go. We, our lives take us all over the place. We should not be restricted by a, a county. So this is the kind of services that we're looking at. A lot of this other components are not really registered here, but there's capital investment. There's real-time information. We're looking at a regional fare card that can navigate all the different systems. And it's about connecting all the different services together so your trip is seamless to get you where you want to go, when you want to get there. So as a result of all this work, there's a kind of a yield, which is not coming up. Oh, um, jobs supported, uh, about 946,000 jobs. Um, residents are going to be impacted to be able to get to where they want to go. We want to support colleges. Uh, universities and schools. So people needing to get education institutions can get there. Heard often when we were out in the public domain, people can't even get to jobs, they can't get to fresh food, they can't get to an education. Hospitals, people are putting off doctor's appointments because they can't get where they want to go. Uh, grocery stores, and be able to get to parks. And that doesn't round out everything, but these are some highlights that we wanted to be real clear about. Now, the, the, the yield on all this economic yield is supporting about uh, 67,800 jobs. I mean, that's huge over the next 20 years. Uh, adding about $6 billion in gross regional product is another byproduct of this plan. And finally, supporting increase in personal income by 4.4 billion. So our plan is out there. We just launched on Monday. We'll be doing a lot of outreach and engagement. It's a critical time for Southeast Michigan so we can get this right, we can get connected, we can get caught up um, and do better uh, for our constituents and our region. So we can attract people, we can have people be maintained here so they don't have to go somewhere else, attract more businesses, and give people the freedom and flexibility that they want in their everyday lives. So we're needing support to move forward, but I just want to let you know this plan is robust, and I think it's going to be a good one for Southeast Michigan. Thank you.
So we are here now for about uh, 15 minutes to take questions and give you some answers. Uh, before we do that, I would like to just mention that Paul Hilligans, who is the chair of the RTA board, is here with us today. Paul has done an amazing job. Many of us in the room know Paul and understand the, the level of leadership that he's provided. So you have question cards on your tables. If you want to fill them out, there are people to take them from you and bring them up to us. But I'll get started with the first question. Uh, and it's really for Tracy and Beth. You've talked a lot about how development follows transit. We have a region, I don't even know how many miles it is. The city alone is 140 square miles. So we have a four county region. What ideas do you have for us on how to get the kind of development that you've talked about in different parts of this large region? Are there strategies that can work? Well, I think the first thing is looking at the land that you have available and what it is that the community wants. So there's a lot of dialogue that has to occur. But then once you've kind of, your planners have figured out, yeah, this area, we've got this space available and we know that this is gonna be office or this is gonna be light industrial, or mixed use or housing, whatever it is, then it's really about going out and talking to the developers and working with your local community to say, well, what do we have to help incent these individuals to invest in our community? And really selling them on the transit and saying, hey, guess what? We're gonna have transit coming in here. We're gonna be able to connect. We wanna have your development open when, it's, when transit's open. So what can we do to help you? What's your gap? Where's your problem? Let's work together to get this done. And, and I'll add, I mean, you, you saw the plan that Michael showed you all. It, it crosses many jurisdictional lines and development does exactly the same thing. And so your approach to development has to be multi-jurisdictional just like your transit planning does. So uh, bringing all the jurisdictions in and talking about how all of this effort will benefit one another is extremely important. What you definitely don't want is to have each jurisdiction fighting each other for that development in a way that undercuts one another. I think we've spent so much time focusing on getting transit that we haven't really had the um, opportunity to think about what comes after. So are there, are there some kind of economic structures we can put in place? Are there uh, TOD organizations that own this process? How does that all kind of structurally look? Uh, I, I can jump in there. Um, we are actually, my organization is funded by the, the Federal Transit Administration to give TOD technical assistance uh, with a focus on it being equitable uh, TOD assistance. And we're working in nine communities this year. And we'll go out again uh, in a competitive process for another crop of communities uh, starting in the new fiscal year to give uh, support as well. Um, this is an area that's growing, and so there are, uh, the, the good news is there are some areas that have had some successes that we can learn, for, uh, learn from, but, you know, it's still new, and so uh, we're, we're constantly compiling and getting new information and bringing it in. And I'd say that in Cleveland, um, as we continue to work on the Health Tech Corridor, we have three other transportation projects that we have underway. And so what we're doing is just working very specifically in those areas with the constituents, with various local governments, having people at the table, philanthropy, um, the businesses that are there, don't forget them as you're trying to attract new businesses, and, and really working on what are, we, what are we gonna put here and how are we gonna do it? And for example, in one of our projects where transit's just really being planned, we're already assembling land, doing brownfield cleanup, doing the work that's gonna need to get done, because if you want developers to come pretty quickly, you've gotta have the land assembled and ready to go. And that's what developers want. They don't want something like, hey, it would be great if you could do this. Well, who owns the land? Well, 17 people. <laughs> um, you've got to get it ready to go. I think economic development people are critically important for that. So your local city is going to really have to be at the table and got to be prepared to say, hey, if you want to make it successful, step up. Yeah, well, Tracy just yada yada that a little bit. But there's so much information there that's really, really, really important. They did a major assessment along this corridor to figure out what they actually had mm -hmm. so that they could figure out what Brownfield's investment has to happen, so they can figure out the land assemblage. That sort of work needs to be done by the government. There's no one else that's going to do it. Right. right. 
Michael, uh, we have some questions specifically about the, the master plan. Uh, first one is, how were residents engaged in the development of the plan that was presented on Tuesday? Well, we've done probably over 124 meetings throughout the Fort County region. Um, so we have continued to be out there uh, since day one. Uh, we've worked with a lot of partners in this process. Our BRT uh, <laughs> projects um, also involve technical teams uh, and policy teams along the corridor. So we were involving folks all throughout that process. Uh, we utilize social media. Uh, we've been, again, out um, over the last year and a half listening to people. And I would also just say it's a culmination of all that listening and input that's helped create the plan that we have before you. So we've taken great time, given the timeline that we do have, to solicit as much information, hear what people have to say, and really wanting to make sure that we get it right going forward. Uh, we have a question that's got some very specific uh, items about the funding model for our system, the sources of financing, whether it requires a long-term subsidy, uh, how do the typical fares play out? Michael, has that all been determined at this point? Well, we're still working on the fares, but um, you know, this is a 20-year um, uh, millage that we're looking at right now. Uh, we'd look to yield a fi a uh, federal and state funding, grants, uh, fare box return. Uh, what would I say that we really looked at this and looked at the political realities and the financial constraints to put together the best plan that we could given um, what we know about the communities that we're serving. So uh, we've done a lot of work that's uh, detailed in our, um, our plan that is out on our website at uh, rtamichigan.org. Um, or afterwards, I'm happy to, to get into a little bit more detail with that. But and then a, a follow-on question, will we be able to have a single fare for uh, a person who gets on any, any mode within the system? Will they pay multiple times to take multiple oh, legs the, of the system? The opportunity that we have before us to have one fare card, you as the end user will load it up, whether it's a phone, whether it's a card, whether it's some other instrument. Uh, and that'll be deducted, but you will just have one type of card that will get you where you want to go. We want to make it as seamless, as easy as possible, as customer friendly as possible, and provide different options for folks that maybe can't afford a card or need some other sources uh, of ways to navigate. So we're looking at all those different uh, avenues and elements. And then the time horizon for the development of the, of the full plan. <clears throat> Well, we believe that we can get everything done uh, within five years with the exception of two of the BRT routes, but um, we are poised and ready to move forward. And if there are ways we can work with new starts and small starts programs to accelerate that process, we're definitely looking into that as well. But the majority of the plan will be uh, completed in five years with the exception of the two our BRT routes that we're, we're needing to do. But again, in talking to folks in DC and others, there may be ways in which to move the process quicker than the traditional model. So this is a question for anyone who wants to chime in. Uh, what are three things a region can do to convince voters to actually pay for regional transit? You talked a lot about systems that are seeking new funding mechanisms. What are some of the ideas that you've seen work in the country? Well, I think an important part is to really help people understand that companies now are making decisions based on transit. Millennials, a lot of them don't have cars. They want to make sure that there's transit opportunities. And for companies to be able to attract that type of talent, they have to be located near transit. So by collecting examples of companies that have made that move, I think that's really important. For the first time in my career, I've been doing this for 33 years, when I went after Dealer Tire, they were looking at a suburban location, and I literally used transit score, walk score, and bike score for the first time in my career to help sell them on the fact that they didn't want to go to the suburbs, they wanted to be in Cleveland. And it, they had never seen that before, and when they looked at it, it finally occurred to them, hey, this is important. So I would say that's one thing for sure you've got to really put that together and help people understand it. Beth, any ideas? Yeah, I, I think uh, engagement of the business community is extremely important, and all the communities that have built transit 
really at all, but certainly quickly and successfully have done it because they've had the strong support of the business community and members of that community coming out and explaining why this matters. And a lot of times it is, if, if you want me to stay in your community, I have to be able to attract talent and this is what talent is telling me. These are the places they're moving to, this is the environment they want. Um, sometimes it's reminding people that even if they don't take transit, they benefit from transit as well. Uh, and, and there was a great campaign in the St. Louis area that, that did that and pointed out that, you know, for example, you might not take transit to the hospital, but your nurse might, and it's not very get, good to get to the hospital and not have a nurse there. And kind of reminding people how it doesn't have to be, everything that the government pays for doesn't have to be used by every single citizen to be worth paying for. Uh, this question, I think, is intended for me because it's specifically about Kresge, so I'll answer it in a minute. But uh, can you confirm, Tracy, that it costs $50 million to build 9.38 miles of BRT in Cleveland? Is That's, that the accurate figure? That was the number back then, okay. what we had to put in. So the question was, we've got a comparison of $50 million for 9.38 miles of BRT, $140 million for 3.3 miles of Q line in Detroit, and the question was, Kresge, how do you feel about this? <laughs> Would you do it again? Uh, you've invested $50 million in this, and I will just speak for, from my perspective at Kresge, that we would absolutely do it again. The amount of development that's taken place in the Woodward Corridor has been amazing, and it's not even active yet. And we also thought it would be a catalyst for exactly this type of development of a regional system, and we'll never be able to prove that it was a catalyst, but it certainly seems like it was. I got our community thinking about the possibilities. So we, we would, I, as a Kresge representative, would do it again a thousand times. So thank you for that question. Uh, Michael, explain how the RTA works. We've got like time for one or two more questions. Explain how the RTA works with existing providers. Are we another provider, RTA, or are we a coordinator? Well, we're a coordinator, um, but we do have oversight. We're kind of an umbrella organization. And again, as I mentioned in the plan, it's about working together. We have to work together to make this thing work. So the existing services that SMART, DDOT, AATA, people will provide is an integrated process. Yeah, but we are the umbrella organization. Uh, federal funds and uh, state money comes through us to, to allocate. We issue coordination directives. And I would offer that this is probably why this opportunity is a lot different than previous attempts.